Hello and welcome back to Jump To It for irishracing.com where we have news, previews and opinion going into this weekend's top racing. Now as ever I'm joined by Stephen Harris and Ed Quigley. Guys I want to bring you in. We did have some breaking news come in this morning from County Kildare about some banned substances being seized. Uh, Stephen I just want to get your thoughts quickly on this. We don't know all the details yet, all the ins and outs, but is it indicative of a wider problem in Irish racing? Well, it does seem to be, Joe. I mean, they, they are finally getting to grips with it. There's been loads of rumours knocking around over the last 12 months or so with Jim Bolger throwing the cat among the pigeons. And it, it does now seem that there's a much stricter, stricter regime in place, which is obviously welcome for punters. There's long been suspicions, hasn't there? Um, which racing is a bit like that. It can be a bit of a hornet's nest of jealousy and envy when other people are being successful. Um, that rumours go around, what are they doing? Are they... You know, he used to be with, I remember Martin Pipe, they used to say he was sort of at a blood laboratory where they used to thin the blood of the horses. But that it's usually related to people who aren't quite so successful casting aspersions about those who are. But um, there does seem to be a wider issue in Ireland. Certainly, this latest uh, uncovering, which is breaking, Joe, um, it'd be interesting to see which direction that goes in over the next few weeks. And of course, all the coverage of this story will be available on irishracing.com. Now, Ed, I want to bring you in as well. You are based a stone's throw away from Cheltenham. We've got a really exciting card, or well, lots of races to discuss from Cheltenham this week. So just give us a quick update on the conditions there. How's the weather looking? Yeah, I've gone into my uh, habitual Michael Fish mode uh, this morning. Um, yeah, the way I describe it, we see fret again. We've got that, we've got that smog coming in over Cle Cleve Hill when I was doing the school run earlier. It's a, uh, look, it, for the pretty much for 10 days now we've hardly had any rain it's just turned a bit damp uh it's going to be absolutely perfect racing ground uh, it has to be said we're only riding slightly slower than the october meeting what's worth noting is though this meeting's ground compared to previous years i remember like when tranquil c1 or alpha rov uh, mo was absolutely flying you know ruby walsh had three pairs of goggles on you're not going to get anything like that uh, i think the mudlarks should be taken off their feet i mean at the time of recording it's officially good to soft good in places couple of showers around tomorrow morning but then uh, throughout the rest of friday saturday and sunday the, the temperatures up into double figures with the sun coming out so yeah for this time of year uh, and compared to previous meetings especially you're looking at the ground riding substantially quicker than you'd be used to great stuff now we will be going more in depth into the races at cheltenham later on in the show but i just want to kick off with a quick discussion about the king george of course manila endo potentially could be going there. Envoy LN was back with a win last weekend as well. So Stephen, let's get your quick thoughts on how the King George is shaping up and who do you think is even going to compete in the race? Well, I mean, that is an interesting question. Joe. I think it's about six weeks away, isn't it? Which is amazing. Everything starts to get compressed now um, up until Christmas. I mean, at the moment, Kempton, uh, they had a meeting in the week. It was good ground. I mean, we've not had rain here of any substance for about two months, I don't think. And they'll be chucky on water. I should think he'll be starting to get worried over the next three weeks if the weather doesn't change. Minello Indo would be an interesting runner. I mean, I think there were more negatives than positives about his return. I know everyone said he probably needed the run. He didn't jump very well. Um, I know Frodon is a magnificent mm. jumper, but Minello Indo lost half a length at plenty of the fences. I thought it was a pretty underwhelming return. Henry de Bromhead's Horses maybe have been needing a run or two, but they seem to be coming right now. I'd have thought Alaho might be an interesting runner if he goes to the King George, but all the running plans are up in the air. I will say that I'm waiting patiently, I think was on plenty of people's shortlists for the King George. He's going to go to the Betfair Chase at Haydock in a couple of weeks. So he'd be a very interesting runner in that particular race. And how about for you, Ed? Any kind of early fancies from an anti-post point of view for the King George? Yeah, it's a, it's a good point. I've just very quickly also, just final bit on the chart of ground, I should point out, they've actually had to water in the last week in order to take the sting out of it, um, which is a, a leading on from Stephen's point about a lot of these race courses almost unheard of in mm. the, the middle of November, uh, looking to try and put water on courses. But so be it. I mean, yeah, the reason we're on the King George chat is because of the kind of the the wealth of the the kind of the horses within Ireland and the kind of owner trader politics, I think we're going to be seeing, haven't we? I mean, one of the key questions or one of the, the kind of divisive uh, questions at the moment is what do you do with Envoy Allen? Uh, do you perhaps roll him over three miles in the King George? Do you go the John Durkin over two and a half and then come back New Year? Do you, he's not short of pace. Do you bring him back to two? Uh, and then of course you've got Alaho for Cheveley Park. 
and you've got a Plutar for Chiefly Park. Mm. <laughs> so there's there's a lot going on here. And then Henry de Bromhead also has Nella Indo uh, in the same stable as well. So there's, there's a lot of head scratching to do. I mean, for what it's worth, just my kind of gut feeling is I, I think Manella Indo is almost going to run into King George on sufferance for the fact he wants to keep a Plutard and Manella Indo apart. I, Manella Indo mm. does not strike me as the type of horse who wants good ground and easy three miles. I mean, he is a relentless old fashioned galloper. Like, mm. uh, he, uh, as Henry de Bromhead says, he grows an extra leg when he comes to Cheltenham. And I wouldn't be too worried about what he does this side of the Cheltenham Festival, to be honest with you. Uh, I think I. A Plutard would be the natural horse for Kempton, an easy three miles because he's a strong traveller, but he has to go left-handed, according to the trainer, which is why he's going to go to the Betfair chase and then on to the Savile chase. So to to, to kind of summarise, if you ask me what I would do with him, I would probably roll the dice with uh, Envoy Allen in the King George. Sooner rather than later, you'd like to know whether three miles is an option. If he comes home with the petrol light on there, then you know you can kind of uh, scrap that staying plan, at least for now. Alaho is the horse, I think, you know, if you were going to look back at uh, last year's Ryan Air Chase, one of the most impressive performances I could ever remember, where he, he had some really good horses absolutely cooked coming the three out. And so, uh, yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot of head scratching to go. I I I think they they will probably end up running Alaho in the King George. Envoy Allen, I'm not sure about. I think Manella Indo will probably come over to the King George. A Plutard will probably stay in Ireland. I've probably got that totally wrong, but there's a there's a lot of um there's a lot of owner trainer politics there. Uh, a lot. It's a nice problem to have for some of those trainers. But uh, in regards to the home team, Plan de Zobo and Frodon go there by default, don't they really? Uh, and now the one that's come through into the mix, I suppose, is uh, Chantry House. It sounds like it's going to have a crack at it after his um his really hard, a uh, grueling comeback run against the uh, the big breakaway <laughs> sundown the other day um, by 37 lengths, um, where he got a nice little um, race course gallop. So, yeah, lots to think about. Very tricky race for punters um, from an anti-post perspective, because uh, usually, even me, you know, I get told off by this far in advance, start the, you know, get, making strong opinions about races. But I generally think, uh, you know, the, the complexion that the King George could change minute by minute. I think there's a big uncertainty, even amongst connections uh, of a lot of those Irish horses to who's actually going to turn up. One thing you do know is Flanders Obo and Frodon will run and they're the first and second favourites. So, um, yeah, if you're looking for one of those, um, you, you know, you, you probably do a lot worse than stick with a uh, team ditch eat in that scenario. But yeah, uh, a long way off still, but lots to look forward to that race. Yeah, of course, we will be back with more in-depth previews closer to the time. And I want to highlight one trainer that has been absolutely on fire as well. Last week, we did speak about the Breeders' Cup, but Charlie Appleby, what a performance it was for him. Stephen, talk us through how, how he did so well. Was it a surprise for you or do you think, yeah, he's kind of come shown his colours? Well, he's blossomed this season. It's been, he's been a breath, breath of fresh air. We're going to talk a bit later on, aren't we, about Dan Skelton and his social media activities. And Charlie Appleby is so open. I mean, he has... He does almost daily interviews with the racing press where he goes through his team, their plans, what's gone wrong. He's complete open book. And if you compare him with someone from the old school, for example, Sir Michael Stout, which is a bit like trying to open an oyster to find out the secret of what's inside. Uh, he's a very reluctant sort of tail swishing interviewee, whereas Charlie Appleby is a complete open book. I mean, the performance of Yabir. I mean, I didn't watch it live. It's too late for me these days, to be honest, Joe. <laughs> but I watched it the next day. Uh, your beer, you sort of had to play it back three times to believe he actually won. He had a car park trip throughout. He was in an appalling position and he made up about 15 lengths in a furlong. I mean, William Buick, as he crossed the line, was shaking his head in disbelief that he'd actually managed to get up. It was a pretty staggering performance. <laughs> Great stuff. Now, Ed, I also want to talk to you about a, an impressive story this week. A big comeback is on the cars. The last lion after five years away from the track. T tell us about this story and what an uh, amazing comeback it, w it would be if he goes and wins on Saturday. Yeah, I know. The last time that horse was on the racetrack. I mean, yeah, I didn't have children, didn't have grey hairs. And um, yeah, uh, yeah, the only Corona people knew about was the, the bottled variety with a slice of lime in it, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, yeah, I know. Pretty mad, really. The horse went off the studs, uh, been firing blanks. And uh, I, I was saying to, <coughs> chat to Stephen uh, a couple of days ago off air about it. I mean, was, I can remember George Washington came back after maybe a season or Barney Roy, perhaps after a couple of seasons. But yeah, a middle, the 2016 middle park winner uh, back on the racetrack five years later. Yeah, yeah, by all accounts, has been back in since May uh, working. And yeah, I suppose, look, it's great, isn't it? We, we all moan about uh, kind of the 
the fleetingness of the flat season that you do Ooh. see some sparkly performances, but all kind of compacted into the space of four or five months. And then they retire off to breeding sheds and that's it. Yeah. Never heard of or seen of again. But yeah, this is taking it to a new extreme, isn't it? So yeah, <laughs> um, I'm just, yeah, fair play. Good. The horse wants to run, <laughs> showing his enthusiasm at home. Something to look forward to, definitely. Of course, you can get eight to one about uh, the last line winning that race as well at Lingfield on Saturday. Now we're going to move on. We have touched on it already a little bit in the show so far. That is the Betfair Chase. So, yeah, we mentioned uh, waiting patiently, of course, uh, on Saturday week. We're going to talk about this now. So, Stephen, just give us a little bit of a breakdown of how the Betfair Chase is shaping up. Well, I mean, usually, um, Joe, this is a race running soft ground. Um, four or five runners, Bristol de May goes out in front and comes home by three fences. And it's sort of like <laughs> a song in behind. They're all absolutely legless. But this year at the moment, um, Haydock, of course, usually guilty of overwatering during the, the summer season. But at the moment, I would have thought they're going to be good, good to soft ground at worst, unless things dramatically change, which doesn't look likely in the, in the forecast for what that's worth. So the one I thought was really interesting at the moment um, is waiting patiently, who's left Ruth Jefferson and gone to Christian Williams, who's one of the best up-and-coming young trainers. He's now starting to add quad quality to quantities. Trains in uh, Ogmore by the sea down in deepest Wales. Mm. They're all running on the beach every day. Absolutely fantastic. He's also brilliant at social media, Christian as well. And apparently, waiting patiently, um, is working absolutely fantastically at home. He's miles in front of their next best horse. Uh, and he's a really, really exciting prospect. And those of us with a long memory will remember waiting patiently, gliding round on the bridle under Brian Hughes. Sometimes he didn't always produce what looked likely, but he could really improve for a change of scenery. And he's certainly a fascinating runner. At this stage, barring accidents, he's a definite runner in the Betfair chase. And I was looking on the exchanges earlier. He's a double-figure price at the moment. All right, there's no liquidity there, but he might be one to for um, jump to it, punters to back now, because if he gets there in the next couple of weeks, I can't see him being 10 or 12 to 1. Well, that's it. I mean, I was looking at the odds moving myself as well. He was out at 20 to 1 in places, and now he's as short as 7 to 1 with some bookmakers. Right. So, Ed, I mean, just yeah. for you as well, I mean, what's your kind of angle into the Betfair chase? And what do you think it'll be before waiting patiently to win? Well, I echo a lot of Stephen's sentiments. The key point here is the ground. You know, uh, Bristol Demai has mm. been, you know, nicknamed Haydock Demai, hasn't he, really? Uh, mm. I mean, absolutely revels in soft ground I mean, he has performed on a quicker surface but essentially this race is pretty much priced up on the basis we're going to get deep ground i mean bristol de mine at 72 rural pagai has been well back to recent times of course mm. underperformed in the gold cup but on flat tracks of deep grounds a horse you really respect uh, it is a race that will literally is going to be polarized by ground conditions and the long forecast perhaps suggests that we're not going to get the usual heavy ground in which case yeah steve does make a lot of sense waiting patiently been a pretty frustrating horse uh, and been a pretty well-named horse, it has to be said, mm. over the last couple of years. But clearly, a flat track three miles, I think, is exactly what the horse needs. If you could just guarantee those rain clouds don't arrive um, up in the northwest uh, in the week of the race, then he's definitely a player because he's a strong traveller. I, I mean, yeah, there's lots of talking points here. I think we're going to get a pretty good feel for once in one of these grey ones. Um, and, of course, the, the horse, which a lot of people are going to be talking about coming back, is Champ. Uh, by mm. all accounts is going to run a horse you promised so much but I've never been convinced with as a jumper at the top level and 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 I suppose you could then looking outside of that we're not going to go through them all today but the, obviously we touched upon it earlier on the show the race does roll around the fact that Apple Tard, of course runner up in the Charlton Gold Cup is due to make his seasonal reappearance in this um I, I, sp I suppose Hammy de Bromberg wouldn't send him over here at 70%, if you know what I'm saying. I, I imagine he'd be pretty wound up for that contest. So, again, though, I'm not sure he'd really want ground conditions to turn into a swamp and it turn into an out-and-out -out test of stamina. Plutard is a strong travelling type. He's got speed from two miles, two and a half miles. So, fascinating contest. Uh, my view is, yeah, it, I... I, I, I said a lot of logic in what Stephen's saying there. You could roll the dice and wait impatiently, knowing that he's on target for the race. And if the ground has come in his favour, he'll probably start half the price he is now. I'm just going to kind of hang far a little bit and just wait for those, uh, see what those winds do in the northwest. Because, yeah, rain, seriously, uh, if it absolutely hammers it down, the rain goes soft, the heavy, this is going to cut up to a five runner race with Bristol to my shade of odds on, Royal, Royal Pagai in it, it's seven to four, and they might not even send a Plutard over. If crown conditions stay mm. good, good to soft, you could be looking at a, a nine, 10 runner field, and uh, yeah, you could see a totally different complexion. So, yeah, boring kind of um, narrative, but definitely keep your eye on the weather for this one because there's so many ground dependent horses in here. 
Of course, it gives us a good opportunity to then plug next week's show where we'll know more and we'll be able to go more in depth on the Betfair chase. Now, the last item of news I want to highlight as well is Dan Scouton. We touched on it earlier in the show, but the fact that he's taken to social media, taken to YouTube to post updates on a horse leading up to a big race. So the first of his new series is about third time lucky. So Stephen, from your perspective as a punter, do you think this is actually really good to maybe get behind a horse, see what's going on behind the scenes a little bit? and to give you a better feel for then backing that horse? Absolutely, Joe. I think, um, to be fair, I've been talking about the older guard of trainers. Paul Nichols has led the way in this. He is another one, completely open. He has a column Friday and Saturday every week. He's always on television telling you exactly about his horses. And Dan, of course, who was a pupil with Paul, um, has, has, has picked up the baton where he left off. And he's now doing this thing where he's discussing the Saturday horse, one that won a week, Throughout the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, on the lead up to the big weekend of racing, the preparation, how they get them fresh, how much work they've had, anything that's gone wrong, the treatment. You can see the meticulous planning that goes into every runner that Dan has. And actually, I've been lucky enough to be up to his gallops and spend a day there because my friend owns a few horses um, with, with him. And the facilities are absolutely incredible, not just for the horses. I mean, they've mm. actually got a hotel for the staff on site uh, they're incredibly well looked after i think he's got 180 horses this season which is pretty incredible numbers um he's right up there with the sort of biggest trainers in britain and ireland now and they're trying to shift from um running them you know 10 horses a day at worcester in the summer to having proper saturday horses grade one horses that's the aim it's been a slow transition they, they've had a quiet summer but i think that's the plan now and you'll see that every weekend he's going to kick into the gear and as we look at Cheltenham this weekend, um, I've actually tipped up virtually the whole yard he's got running. I don't know how what the prices are going to be like. Perhaps not wonderful. But he also, I wanted to mention one he ran at Carlisle in the week called Nurse Susan, who is sent off a very well-backed two-to-one favourite in a big field at Carlisle. They went a pro proper gallop, first time on a race course, and he won pulling a cart. And the front two were a furlong clear of the rest. Nurse Susan is very much a horse. The jump to it followers to put in their notebook. Great stuff. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, but for Ed, your view on this as well, I mean, is it really good for the image of racing to have trainers come out, show what goes on behind the scenes rather than kind of keeping it a bit hush hush? Yeah, absolutely. It, it really is, isn't it? Um, I, I mean, a, a lot of trainers are tied into uh, kind of affiliated with bookmakers uh, these days and stuff. So in terms of like running plans and targets and things, I think that becomes a little bit of a grey area in terms of what they can kind of release the general public. I, I seem to get that impression. But in terms of the actual the welfare and the the horsey side of things i think it's absolutely brilliant yeah really so uh we, we saw that third time lucky and it you know having the lights on him to improve his coat and talking about how often he gets his coat clipped and of course uh, dan scouting was straight on the uh in front of the camera wasn't he in, in the aftermath of shamblu's uh, little setback and so it, mm. it, it's great in terms of yeah you often i said a lot of these things you you see the horses either win or lose, and then don't hear about them again for six weeks. Um, it, it, it's good in terms of trying to broaden the appeal and give you a, a better, give the public at least, or social media, a better understanding of what goes on behind the scenes. Yeah, so I'm all for it. And of course, third time lucky is looking like he is going to be the odds on favourite. So it looks like a good chance to have a winning start for that series for Dan Skelton. Then the narrative is pretty nice that he followed his progress through the week and then you back him on the Ooh. Saturday for a winner um, but now we're going to cover the upcoming races and this week it is pretty much all about Cheltenham so the first race we are going to look at does feature another Dan Scout and charge my Drogo is the odds on favorite now down to two runners in the 220 Stephen take us through this one I mean does it really interest you from a punting point of view I mean or is it just going to be a pointer for the future well, it's a good, a good race to watch and learn about. I mean, you've got it's a match now. Two runners, Gin and Lime, who's had seven goes already, won four of them. Likely to front run Rachel Blackmore and Harry will sit second on my Drogo. First time out over fences, um, schooling well, fully hundred percent fit. Will love the ease, decent ground, and I expect my Drogo will go past Gin and Lime up the hill. It all being well if he jumps properly. That that's about about the size of it. I mean, this is an absolute disaster for racing. One of our big days, three days at Cheltenham, and the field sizes away from the mm. huge handicaps are very, very disappointing. I mean, we've said this, Joe, for the last two year or so on this show, there's far, far, far too much racing, full stop, end of sentence. And what amuses me most, I mean, I, must, I live on Twitter, 
you get the, the, the senior traders on from big bookmakers moaning about the field sizes. Well, these are the people for the last 10 years want more racing, more racing, more. <laughs> they want racing at 11.07, 11.13, 11.21. They'd have a race every 25 seconds if they could. They just want turnover on their websites. They have no interest in the health or prosperity of the sport in the longer term. It's just a vehicle for betting turnover. And unfortunately, we're now reaping the rewards of that. We've got far, far too much racing. And the trainers, don't. You, there isn't a big enough pool of horses to run in all these races uh, at certain levels. Um, the whole thing needs ripping up and starting again. You know, we've been saying the same thing for a very long time now. And all that ends up happening is the BHA gets someone new in, equally clueless as the last person. And there's 12 extra fixtures in 2022. And in 2023, there'll be another 20 extra fixtures. But they'll pretend to rearrange it a bit. It'll be more bookmaker friendly. We'll be racing every five minutes. Absolutely ridiculous. Well, let's hope that, yeah, do, things do change for the better. But for you, Ed, as a spectacle point of view from enjoying the race, um, do you prefer like a big field or is it this more fascinating to see a bit of a matchup, like you say, like a head-to-head -head with My Drogo and a gin online? Oh, I'm absolutely buzzing for this. I, I love these two runner contests. This has been uh, brilliant. Yeah, you don't want to fill the field with absolute uh, 120 rated no-hopers. But no, no, uh, Stephen makes a really good point. Uh, I, I mean, again... It, it seems that everyone goes all really geeky and all these fake philosophers come out and start, there's too much racing. I am, I, 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 I held my hands up, sound like a hypocrite. I haven't got the list of the, the two and a half mile novice chases in front of me, but I was looking through it on the BHA fixture list the other day. There's an up team two and a half mile novice chases within the space of about three weeks. You, can, you need to cull three quarters of those and then you're going to have to force horses to meet because there's just, literally there aren't enough horses to go around. I, it's all very well people moaning about these races and i say well and then i say well who would you actually run in it then name me horses who should be lining up in this and then people quote horses who've either run in the rising stars at wing canton last mm -hmm. week or going to run in it it's just not enough horses it's a straightforward you could do you could do away with three quarters of these novice chases uh and it would it would in in the end it would force horses to have to meet each other so look uh, as a spectacle i as you know i'm on my drogo for the marsh chase antipode so i'm hoping he he, he jumps like a third time lucky did on chase debut and wins easily mm. uh, do you know lime's no mug she's got experience just not forget mm. is my drogo's chase debut over some yeah. pretty stiff fences uh gin on lime uh yeah she's she's a useful looking mare bolted up last time out i mean she's got to give a pound of my drogo officially at the weights uh, on her from hurdle rating what she's about eight pound wrong here uh look my drogo i cannot imagine for the life of me dan scouter would have sent my drogo to chow the first time out over fences if undercooked or needing to run they would have found a, a you know faked them to do that job so i expect my drogo should hopefully take to the fences i mean he is a real physically imposing sort you saw him at entry in the paddock uh, compared to some of those others in, back in April. I mean, he dwarfed them. He's, he's a proper chaser. I hope he jumps around and wins. Yeah, there's the political side of things. Uh, again, we'll still be having this conversation in a year's time. Um, I've been having it on about five years ago. I was having it on, on Sky Sports. <laughs> it just never happens. It's just too much racing. It's just too much racing. Um, too many, I, I think specifically in novice chases, sorry to go off on a little bit of a tangent here, but it's worth noting the opening race on the Friday at Cheltenham is the 20 runner handicap. There were 23 horses balloting out. Mm. You know, the, it's, yeah. just, it's, it's not a case of too much racing full stop. There's too many, certain races are just, there's too many off. And uh, novice chases, mm. there are, it's just too many. You've only got a novice chase is going to run three or four times a season. When you're throwing on a, a dozen novice chases within the space of three weeks, you just don't have to pull the horses to run in. Now, Stephen, I just want to bring you in a little bit here about my Drogo is your one to watch, right, for the, the rest of the season. So kind of what are you hoping for? Just obviously keeping him intact, I'm guessing. But do you want to see a kind of impressive mm. performance? Well, I mean, Dan Scott is absolutely brilliant getting these horses to jump, whether it's hurdles or fences first time out. Uh, my Drogo would have jumped a thousand fences at home. I mean, he's got, I suppose I am Maximus, the only horse that beat him. Uh, last year, which was in a bumper at Cheltenham, rather let the form down at Exeter in the week, very expensively for those of us who followed the betting expert nap of the day. Um, but uh, he didn't run badly. He was just inexperienced and got Nico de Boinville to touch, jumping left at every hurdle. So my Drago was prolific. He improved run to run, um, really impressive over hurdles last season. There's a win at Kelso. He was absolutely devastating in a strongly run race on soft ground. So I'll be mortified if he's beaten, and I'm sure Dan will be too. But it's a novice chase, jumping first time out. Anything can happen, obviously. But let's hope for a clean round and an impressive display. 
Now that race, of course, is the 220 on Friday. We're going to move on to Saturday now and the 140, where we've touched on third time lucky already. Looks like he's going to be the favourite for this one. Stephen, take us through the betting here. Like I say, third time lucky is the probably going to be the odds on favourite. Um, but what, do you see a surprise coming here potentially? Um, no, I think third time lucky will win. I've never been more impressed by a young horse first time out over the fences. Last time at Cheltenham, um, he jumped like Sprinter Sacker and Altiel. I mean, it was absolutely incredible. For a novice, first time out, at a very, very difficult track to jump round, his jumping was incredible. And here's, there's two keys to third time lucky. I mean, he won three times over hurdles. He was a very useful, high-class handicapper. We had our brains on him in the county. <laughs> um, but Harry rather overdid things there. We're a bit too much too soon there. But the horse was usually dropped out early over hurdles, took a keen grip, and had one run late. Now, in the county hurdle, they used that run up far too soon. He was in front two out, absolutely cantering, and he wilted up the hill. Now, over fences on much better ground, good ground, they let him get on with it. He had the whole field dead after a mile, and that's the key. He's got such a high cruising speed on decent ground. Now, the flip side with third time lucky, I think he's a racing certainty bar a fall on Saturday, is that he's going to end up being about a five-to-one chance for the arc or after Saturday. And I suspect he's more of an Aintree horse than a Cheltenham horse, which is a funny thing to say about horses run well and won at Cheltenham before. But I think in the spring on good ground at Aintree, they won't see him. Whereas in March against the Irish horses on probable soft ground, he could get tired again up the hill. I think he's the speed horse, but I'll be very surprised if he's beaten on Saturday. But Ed, do you see any kind of long shots potentially in this one? No, not really. I mean, you've got the one-two from last week's Rising Stars, haven't you? Um, you know, Connections obviously looked at this as decent pot. It's worth a go. It's a small field. You've got Captain Tom Cat and Mick Pasta lining up again. I actually fancy Mick Pasta to reverse the form of Captain Tom Cat uh, for two reasons. A, horse is coming back to two miles. He's all about speed and doesn't find a lot off the bridle. So I think that would help him. And obviously, Captain Tom Cat has to carry that grade two penalty coming into this. Uh, so Mick Past is getting five pounds off. So, uh, and Sylvester Pole, uh, to use Stephen's lovely phrase, and more seconds than Oliver Twist at the bottom. He's also going <laughs> absolutely mad. I, I knacked him on this show a couple of times. Uh, he'll be one for two and a half mile handicaps later on. So, uh, in answer to your question here, you've got third time lucky's uh, round two's on. I think we'll win, and I think Mick Pasta will be the most likely to follow him home uh, again. It, it, it is one of those, if you think third time lucky, uh, even though he's as short as what. 10 to 1 for the Arkle. Now, if you think he's going to win this by 30 lengths, uh, then you might as well back it for the Arkle now because you can trade off straight after because we all know what um, bookmaker overreaction is like these days. So, yeah, definitely got more on his plate, though, when you look at all the official figures. You know, Mick Pastor is rate 147. You have got a, a Captain Tom Cat said he's the Rising Stars winner. So, I don't think this would be a cakewalk, but uh, Buddy Rich, the horse, third time lucky, swatted aside last time out since come out and won in Ireland. So the form of his chase debut chart, I'm starting to look okay, isn't it? But yeah, third time lucky, exciting type. I expect no messing around here. Get the job done. And yeah, I'll go with a Mick Pasta for forecast players. All right. Well, let's move on to the big race of the day on Saturday, the Paddy Power Gold Cup at Channel, of course, the 215. Looks like Dan Skelton's protector app will go off as the favourite, but it is pretty close in the betting. Ed, I know you like Caribbean Boy for this one. So let's just talk through why that is and, and how do you see him running? Well, he's, he's one of my four um, to be an absolute fence sitter here, uh, Joe, to be honest with you. Yeah, I, I've shortlisted this for, uh, as four, four horses, really. I'm, I'm the, I've, I don't have a strong view on this. I think it's so uh, competitive. But yeah, I've got a Caribbean boy, Layla, joined Paul Nichols and then had a wind operation. Uh, greatest respect to Kaylee Willicott. I mean, joining Paul Nichols and having a wind op, uh, that's going to be worth a few pounds. That horse could be treated off 149. But the uh, cat's out of the bag with that one with Layla. I mean, he was 20 to 1. Uh, six weeks ago, he's now what round nine to two joint favourite. A uh, Caribbean boy, uh, you touched upon Joe. No, good point. Uh, he produced his best performance last season, first time out on good ground. Uh, when he thumped uh, Fiddle on the roof. Of course, that horse has gone on to win the Colin Parker. Uh, Caribbean boy's form kind of unravelled on deep winter ground after that. So he's definitely one to take note of. And then a couple of, um, to use our old friend Shane Anderson's phrase, a couple of, couple of raffies we got in here. Um, <laughs> I got um, Deir and the Kayak is a horse I'm, I'm interested in for Alan King. We targeted this race for some time. Dropped a dangerous mark here of 137. You, he, he's been a little bit stop start of injury, but they've had a clean bill of health in him. And you only go back to his form of 18 months ago. 
you know, he was chasing home the likes of Champ and Midnight Shadow uh, in some big races. They're all rated 150, 160 plus. He's in here off 137. And crucially, he does need good ground. Uh, and the, the fourth of my shortlist was the uh, the Brian Ellison horse, uh, Nisha, at the bottom there, who snuck in at number 20 on the list for Danny Menemin and Brian Ellison. Horse is only one pound higher uh, than when winning uh, air back in the spring. So that are my kind of four. Uh, I've, I've backed Day and the Kayak and I've backed um, Layla Anti Post. I'm probably going to do some form of exotic and perm them all up so I can disappear off like Vincent to the Maldives or something for next week's show. So, um, yeah, that's the kind of plan. But uh, I think this is um, a wider. But I know Stephen's going to disagree with me. On balance, at the prices, I'll be against the Dan Skelton Horse Protector. Right? I just wonder. In the eight tree race, you know, he, he mm. beat hit he beat Hitman, who's let the form down since yeah. uh, the Shunter has yeah. as well. I suppose you could, you know, counter that with saying Al Dorado Allen's come out and won uh, the Holding Gold Cup. I just wonder if one five four on the balance of what he's actually achieved just is just a little bit, um, a little bit too high. You know, he was stumped at Kelso before that, wasn't he? Mm. And then it went when Canton he was beaten when two's on by Messier de Zobo. Uh, I, I got never. Nothing gets the horse. I just wonder whether his marks a little bit inflated for beating up a few horses at entry at the end of the season. But he's still unexposed. He's got the right profile, and just it's more the price doesn't excite me at, at, at knocking on four to one more necessarily than what he could achieve. Well, Stephen, then over to you. What excites you about the Paddy Power Gold Cup? Which angles do you are you looking at for this race? Well, I think the thing to say, Joe, is that they're going to go a right gallop here. Cool Cody, and there's about four others who mm. wants a front run and on good ground, which I think it probably will be by 2.15 on Saturday afternoon. I think they'll go really fast. Protector, I, I do agree in some ways with Ed, although I have tipped him and I, I think he's the most likely winner. I, I was looking at seven or eight to one earlier in the week. He is now about five. So perhaps like a lot of things, the juice has gone out of his price uh, now if you're not on an eight to one. But that being said, the ground's the key. A lot of these mm. horses want softer ground. And my, with Protector at, he is a good ground glider. He flew round here over two mile four when he made all the running as a novice. Um, Ed said about his run at Wing Canton. I don't think he was right that day. I thought he half went a miss about three out there and he finished weekly against a very good horse, Messier de Zobo. <clears throat> and then at Kelso, he wasn't right. He was beaten after about 100 yards. I think Dan took a, a few horses up to Kelso and they all ran like absolute drains that day from memory. So <clears throat> um, I, th I still think he's a horse with potential. Um, again, I take on board what Ed said. That I'm not a mad fan of judging horses on their last run of the season in the spring as as, as a guide to what they're going to do um, mm. a few months later when they start off again in a new season. And 154 um, is probably high enough for protector. That being said, I do think that the key is the fast pace and the good mm. ground. I can just see Skelton, Harry Skelton, cruising on the bridle on protector at, whereas a few of these old sluggers who are a bit more exposed might be short of pace on good ground. So mm. he was my selection. Um, coming back to one Ed touched on, Laylor, 20 into five in the last seven days, a fascinating runner. Um, now, we always talk about the last few minutes on the exchanges, Joe, um, as a guide to what's expected. Now, Laylor, if he's a firm sort of nine to two, five to one chance, he'll obviously be stable nap, primed for the day, um, absolute job laid out, 100% fit. If, and I suspect this might be the case, he goes back out to 10 or 12 to 1, you'll find out that he'd shortened up because he's been tipped up by Tony Calvin or someone <laughs> similar earlier in the week. He's collapsed in price and it's not actual real money. Mm -hmm. It's a tipster's money and he's following basically. So we'll see. But nonetheless, Laylor, obviously a fascinating runner. Indeed. Now, moving on to Sunday and a big return as well. Tiger Roll is back. Uh, Ed, just talk us through kind of yeah, obviously a six-time Cheltenham winner, two-time Grand National winner, but how good is it for him to be back? And are you excited about the return? Yeah, I mean, it's good to see him back, isn't it, really? Uh, I'd be absolutely shocked if he... Uh, I don't want to get myself into libel hot water here, but I'd be shocked if he won. Uh, when he gets entered up into this, not the cross-country off top weight, and then the uh, connections are saying, well, we'll see what the handicapper does in regards to whether he comes back to the Grand National in, uh, in April. I, I think a few... Few low key runs would be uh, would be the order of the day, but no, look, he's been a he's been a wonderful horse, um, fantastic record at Cheltenham, ain't you? Wherever, I mean, quite remarkable, really. I think he was winning that Triumph Hurdle going back to medieval times, mm. and he's still doing it now. Uh, a horse, I've got to admit, 
uh, I had totally written off. I thought he was a uh, it was nearer retirement than he was getting back in the winners' enclosure. And then um, how wrong could I be when he uh, he got the job done back at the Charter Festival? So yeah, good to see him back. Uh, I think it was about a double figure price to win, or around eight to one or something. I, I think there'll be other days for him would be the way I'd phrase it. But um, yeah, I, I just think they'll get him around, get him back in working order, and then they'll. Um, it sounds like they're going to give one last hurrah in the Grand National, depending on. What is is Mark's allotted at the uh, at the February um, the February wine and dine lunch uh, for the Grand National weight? So mm-hmm. yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, it's good to see him back. It's the bottom line. And Stephen, for your views on this race, I mean, how do you see it going? Do you think Tiger Roll could challenge on his comeback? I, I, I doubt it, Charlie. I mean, I must admit, hands up, Tiger Roll. One of the many things I got very badly wrong in the cross country last year. Um, the only consolation was I mainly laid him a place at around thirteen to eight, and it was. A, it was a slightly cheaper death than uh, <laughs> he absolutely cruised around better than ever. I mean, it was an incredible transformation. He'd looked a completely gone horse in his two previous runs. Um, so that was quite incredible and very expensive. No, I would have thought on good ground on Sunday, getting him round would be the main thing. He'll end up being about a 40 to one chance, not the current price. Uh, and they'll drop him out and make sure he gets around in one piece with an eye on another day. But it's a, it's a really competitive handicap. We'll, we'll wait and see the final decks, but, yeah, we, it's a pretty hot race. Now, oh, speaking of a hot race as well, the next one we're going to look at, the 220 at Cheltenham, the Schleur Chase. Now, it looks like it's going to be Noob Negra against Put <coughs> the Kettle on. But, Ed, I mean, how much of a danger is Politolog in this one for you? Oh, this is serious. This is really good. I mean, we moan about small fields. I always repeat, I've never got a problem with small fields if they're um, packed full of grade one horses. So, yeah, you've got the one-two from the champion chase. You've got the, the previous winner, Politolog. And then you've got Rouge Vif. Of course, he <coughs> broke the track record in a handicap uh, in the October meeting last year. Um, kind of went off the boil. Of course, all the uh, Mr. Brooks's horses have all joined Paul Nichols now. So Rouge Vif, of course, is in. Left Harry Whitterton is now Paul Nichols. Bryony's going to bribe Rouge Vif. You're going to have Harry Cobden on Politolog. Uh, you've got Put the Kettle on Nubin Egger. And then you've got Sky Pirate as well. Of course, who's never strong travel. Won the Grand Annual. Has plenty of really good chart and form to bang on about. This is a cracking race. Mm. A straightforward answer is... Of balance percentages, I'd probably go and put the kettle on just for the fact she's the champion chaser and she's never lost a race at Presbury Park. But uh, again, a uh, little bit of guesswork in terms of who's fully tuned up with this. If you're looking at the value angle, perhaps Sky Pirate does have race fitness on his side. Yes, he has a little bit to find in regards to official figures, but he has had that recent run under a huge weight at Chatham's October meeting where he finished second, where he was giving away lumps of weight to his rivals. That will have him tuned up for this. And I just did cynical side of me with the likes of Nube Negra and Politolog uh, with an eye on the Tingle Creek in, in a month's time. Maybe, maybe a few of these are coming here 85% with the viewer being right for the Sandown race, if you see what I'm saying. So uh, it's a no-bet race for me, but it is a wonderful spectacle. Yeah, you can have all the moaners you like about small fields. I accept that, that when it's right, this is chock full of quality and it's going to be brilliant to watch. That's absolute box office, isn't it? So, Stephen, let's talk about your view on this race. I mean, what's your angle going into it? Where's the value potentially? Or who do you see is going to win? I actually think Noob Negra is a real good thing here, Joe, to be honest with you. Um, the key is put the kettle on beat Noob Negra in the Queen Mother. It's a substandard renewal. Put the kettle on front running and battle back really gamely. And Noob Negra was given too much to do. Um, the run, the final run at Punchdown, you f- can forget for Noob Negra, is one run too many. He's a smooth traveller, sound jumper with a very smart turn of foot. Sunday, after, uh, Sunday afternoon, I think it'll be good ground. It could even be faster. It could even be on the faster side of good if, if Ed's weather forecast is right. <laughs> Obviously, I'll be sending him out about 8 a.m. to do a quick couple of laps up the hill full of road to find out whether it's uh, faster side of good or not. But Noob Negra will be trained for this race. And here's the key, I think. Um, Rouge Vif with Bryony booked, could be a real spoiler for Put the Kettle on. Mm, In fact, I wouldn't be too sway. If he runs both, if he runs Politolog as well, um, I should think she'll be told to go forwards on Rouge Vif to set things up for Politolog a bit, make it a proper test of stamina. So that's one thing that could be a spoiler for Put the Kettle on. And the fact that some of Henry de Bromhead's horses have been needing the run. So I think Noob Negra around about two to one is probably an out. I agree with um, Ed about Sky Pirate. Um, he's a very strong traveller. He'll like this dry ground and he ran really well first time back. The only thing I'll say about him is I've backed him about five times, including when he finally came right and won um, mm. last season and he got his act together. But he was a bit of a bridal monkey. He mm. had jacked in a few times for pressure. I'm still not sure I completely trust him up the Cheltenham Hill when push comes to shove. And I thought 
on his seasonal debut, there was a little bit of that in evidence again. But he is a different horse now. He's race fit, and Ed's absolutely right. He could pounce if they all if they all take each other on too far out. But Noob Negra two to one for me, half a nap. Yeah, it should be a really great contest. So yeah, looking forward to the Schler on Sunday. Now we're going to move on to the 255 handicap hurdle, the Unibet Greatwood. Now here's, a, again, a big field. We've got 24 entries. Uh, it should be cut down pretty shortly. But Ed, for you, in these kind of races, how important is kind of course and distance form for you back in a winner? Or do you look for other pointers when trying to find the value and the angle into this race? I always take on board course of distance form, it has to be said, uh, Joe, coming into this. However, given the, the merits of this in layman's terms, it is a handicap. I generally like to look for a horse, I think, probably well handicapped, uh, especially someone who's got a bit on the handicapper in this type of race. So, yeah, I mean, um, you know, and they say once bitten, twice shy. Well, I'm the opposite. I'm, I've got my, nailed my colours to the mask of old Tritonic here. And uh, I just want to watch his run back at, uh, in the Chatham's October meeting. Uh, he was very much ridden patiently there with, I thought, with a view of uh, other days ahead. I mean, that's just my prerogative. Uh, and I think that they, they kind of thought, well, we'll get him fit, we'll get him spot on, and we'll get him right for the big day, which is today. You you are getting to a little bit of a point with Tritonic, though. Uh, let's not forget, a horse who looked exceptional when winning the Adonis um, ran flat uh, when, you know, found to scope badly in the Triumph Hurdle, has had a little bit of a stop-start campaign on the flat since, then been beaten in the October meeting. You are starting to make a few excuses for this horse. Nonetheless, he's off one four two. 2 There's a few old sorts in here, which I put a line through, and then I start to kind of condense it down to to five or six horses, if you see what I'm saying, who are, you know, the unexposed types, if you like. So, look, he's a double-figure price. This has been the target. It goes back to the kind of what we've been saying at the top of the show is a lot of the uh, early season form is pretty hard sometimes, unless you're privy to that information, to work out is today's the day or is it a kind of, look, we're, we're looking ahead to bigger targets. I just got the view from Tritonic's run behind our... Let's not forget when he's trying to concede eight pounds to I like to move it. He was beat three and a half lengths at Champs October meeting. He was ridden very much like the Rever days in mind. That was a four-runner race. This is a totally different ball game. Mm. You know, let's not forget Tritonic had a lot of um, experience on the flat in big fields. You know, ran really well in Royal Ascot in a big handicap. I think it's the type of horse they want to go a mad or gallop or good ground. You can switch him off. I don't think these four-runner soft ground muddling affairs... Uh, really, really kind of his bag. So uh, I think it's kind of getting to the point now in, in answer to your question, Joe, where Tritonic's got to deliver, but on good ground in a big field, off one four two, knowing he's been trained for this race, they kind of are no excuses of him on Sunday. So yeah, kind of that's the way I'm going with him at double figure price. And Stephen, for you, are you writing off uh, Tritonic in the Great Wood or do you have a different angle into the race? Well, I, had a, I did back Tritonic the other day when he drifted and I was slightly disappointed. I take what Ed says on board about the small field but he'd never looked that happy a long way out. He didn't jump particularly well, and he was being niggled about a mile out. Now, he did stay on to briefly look threatening, but I thought it was a bit of a flat run. I'd be slightly worried he might still be short of a bit of pace on good ground on Sunday. Um, the one, again, I'm uh, stuck record here, but Dan Skelton's got West Cork, who's been 14, 16, is now about seven or eight. Is very strongly fancied, 100% fit, has been off for 631 days. I wouldn't worry about that. He's on a very attractive handicap, Mark. Um, all of his form is on speed tracks, Huntingdon and Warwick, gliding round there. Um, if he puts in a clean round of jumping after nearly two years off, I think he'll go really close. Um, again, it's a bit after the Lord Mayor's show. It's been a much bigger price, but I should think he should give you a good run for your money. Great stuff. Now, the last race we're going to look at from Cheltenham on Sunday is the Supreme Novices Hurdle uh, Trial. Now, we've got here, looks like I like to move it is going to be the likely favourite. But, Stephen, do you see any worthy competition for the Twiston Davis runner? Well, th this is um, another red hot race. I, I mean, I think I like to move it is the clear form choice and has got the Cheltenham form in the book, um, which is a massive plus. We'll get a positive, uncomplicated ride. He's going to be a three mile chaser in time. I really liked his attitude when he won here at the last meeting. It was a terrific display. One slight niggle at a relatively short price is Nigel Twiston Davis, who, for those of us who are really old, Joe, this doesn't apply to you, obviously, or Ed, for that matter. But <laughs> Thank you. Thank I you, remember, I, I remember Nigel Twiston Davis um, back in the day, 10 odd years ago. He used to have months where he'd not be sighted. All of his runners would be pulled up and run double. And then he'd hit a real hot flush of form where he'd have a month and everything would win. Now, in the recent years, he's proved to be very consistent 
and much better spread evenly throughout the whole season. He doesn't really try too much in the summer, but generally speaking, they're all running well. In the last fortnight, he's had two winners, Nigel Twiston, fair enough, but he's had 33 runners, so his strike rate's around 6%. I haven't noticed loads of really strongly fancied ones running badly, but that being said, around about 2-1, to one, that would be a slight worry to me, but I think he's the clear form choice and certain to be a runner as well. And Ed, for you, do you see any particular route into this one? Yeah, absolutely, Joe. I mean, almost hypocritically, uh, I've, I've talked about Tritonic, obviously, chased home. I like to move it. But I, I, I thought I like to move it was right for the day. I very much had the view Tritonic running that with other days in mind. That would be my angle. So um, yeah. I'm not actually massively convinced about that form, if you see what I'm saying, in the purest sense. And uh, I, I was really taken by a horse from Ollie Murphy. I mean, uh, his, his yard absolutely flying. They've been operating around a 33% strike rate for November. They were near those numbers in October. He's got Washington in here, who's an unbeaten bumper horse. And they went to Bangor on D. Absolutely lost the plot in the preliminaries. Was sweating up. Uh, I think Aidan Coleman, off the top of my head, was on board that day. Uh, had to take his feet out the stirrups. So the, the horse got really agitated yet. Uh, and he was keen to post. He was keen throughout the early part of the race. Yeah, put the race to bed in a matter of strides. I thought it, it was really nice where the, the manner in which the horse went about doing so. So I thought, well, if he can kind of win in that fashion, despite all those things going on, he's clearly got some engine under the bonnet. Now, we talked about it before, I think I like to move it, is going to pretty much live up to his name and not mess around here. Even if this ends up being a 4-5 runner race, this should be run at a good clip. I think that'd be perfect for Washington. Uh, if he lines up, I will be backing him. Of course, we don't have the decks, but uh, I, I think I think the favourite's there to be got at. I mean, I see seven to four there or thereabouts in the anti-post market still. I like to move it. Uh, as I said, I've just slightly questioned, quite, will slightly question that run in October, whether it's um, that good personally or whether it entitles him to be seven to four in this field because Paul Nichols is going to may have his unbeaten horse in here, uh, Sonny Gino. Um, there's a couple of others of real interest as well. So, um, yeah, it's like the bottom line is I will be back in the Ollie Murphy runner if he lines up. Nice one. Now, the final race we're going to look at is over in Punchestown and the 2.05 on Sunday, the Morgiana Hurdle. Of course, Willie Mullins has got plenty of runners in this one, but it looks like Abracadabra could be a bit of an outside shout for this one. But Stephen, take us through the card and uh, who you think is going to challenge for this. Well, um, the ground, first of all, Punchestown, unheard of, good to yielding. I mean... And, and I don't think there's rain forecast there. So that in November is pretty amazing. It's climate change, Joe, isn't it? Apparently they tell us, but it, 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 uh, that is extraordinary in Ireland. Um, they're going to have a small field. It's dominated by Mullins and Elliot, basically. The one who's attracted money, which is probably the clue to what's going to run, Echoes in Rain, who was really impressive over this course and distance on final start last season, um, routing the field. Um, she's a five-year-old. She's open to more improvement. She ran five times on the flat, four times, uh, four wins over hurdles from six starts. She's really improving. She's liable to be A1 for the day. I suppose this will be the fastest ground she'll have run on, unless they do get rain, which might be a negative. But I would imagine this will end up being three or four runners, given that there's only really two stables who've got en runners entered up at this stage. Now, of course, Willie Mullins, like I say, has plenty of runners in here. But Ed, for you, how big a season do you think he's going to have? Is he going to dominate... Cheltenham once again in March. Yeah, every possibility he has one of these uh, these kind of bandwagon seasons. I mean, coming back to this race now, look, I'm, I'm sending out all kinds of Da Vinci Code messages this morning. Now, look, <laughs> it's, ne it's never kind of confusion one for you in the fact that I've backed Echoes in Rain to win the champion hurdle. Uh, I think she can easily improve to be up to that kind of quality. Yet, she's an absolutely abysmal price to win this at even money. Uh, <coughs> as in, she's got it all to prove. I mean, she's got. It, on official figures, you need twenty pounds wrong with Charger. Uh, she'll be getting a stone in a handicap from Abercadabras. Uh, look, so in one sense, I think she's got the potential to make up into a champion hurdle candidate, but she's very much priced up as if she's already there uh, for this race. Uh, so it's one of those. She wouldn't shock me if she won. If she was beaten, finished runner up, uh, kind of you know, beat two or three lengths in the mix to show she was up to this grade. To be honest with you, I wouldn't be too disheartened because I don't think that'd really be an issue going further forward to four or five months down the line. Willie Mannins has said he thinks she's the mayor and what she's doing at home, you can kind of bridge that gap. And uh, you know, we all want to say the next Annie Power, but in terms of she could easily jump the grade. I mean, it, 
look, you've got to respect Willie Mullins. He gets to work all these horses at home. He'll know what's working with who and what's doing what. She could easily go down the mare's route if they wanted to, but he's going to go into deep waters with her. And so in answer to your question, I think she's the most exciting type in here. You know, we've got a lot of horses, lovable horses like Charger, Abracadabras and, and Saudi A are, are lovely for connections, but kind of hold no secrets, shall we say. She's this, you know, unexposed, exciting type, arrives here on a hat trick, uh, only five, totally entitled to prove. But to suggest she was odds on in this, it shocked me, to be honest with you, first time out. Um, and in terms of official figures, suggest she's got mountains to find. So um, uh, in answer to your question, she gets beaten today. I mightn't go and go go in again for the champion hurdle. You see what I'm saying? I just think it'll be a case mm. of give her three or four runs, let her build up. By March, she could easily be up to this class. But it's just the prices are just all wrong for this race, personally. Of course, we'll be back next week to review all of these races that we just previewed as well, looking at the results. But now we're going to move on to the top tips from our team. Uh, Stephen, you didn't have a particularly great week last week, but let's just look back at basically how your runners did. Uh, let's have a look at yeah your review here. Just talk us through how Beakstown did and also Gunsight Ridge. I think I think actually Beakstown ran an absolute scream. He probably just blew up from the last. He travelled and jumped superbly. And similar comments applied to Gunsight Ridge. I think they'll both be winning races, but it wasn't to be last weekend. This weekend, I'm not going to win any prizes for originality, I don't think. I think it's the Dan Skelton show. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't put up Noob Negra as a nap, but I think he'd be Sunday's nap. But on Saturday, uh, third time lucky in the 140, we've already touched on. I think he's a class above these. He'll come home alone on goodish ground. Um, protector out in the 215. Hopefully he'll drift back out to around six or seven to one. I think he'll take a lot of beating. And in the 251, we haven't mentioned yet, Honor Gathering Storm makes his handicap debut. Um, I think he's quite well treated. He ran a lot better than the bare result at the last meeting here when he got a, uh, an injudicious ride. He was dropped out last initially and made all his headway rapidly in the middle of the race and then got tired. Um, he weakened right out of things up the hill. But I think he'll see things out a lot better on decent ground and he'll be ridden with a lot more patience into handicaps now. And, of course, Fergal O'Brien just continues to win everything at the moment. He's absolutely flying. And I think on a gathering storm is a double-figure price, around 10 or 12 to 1. And I think he'll go really close in the 250. Well, we'll definitely be keeping an eye on those as well. And, of course, come back next week to review those results. For you, Ed, you had a better performing week last week. I actually managed to get one unit of profit on your tips to so talk us through of all the gin joints. And, of course, so Royale with the win. Yeah, so Rao got the job done when the um the, down the uh, the elite hurdle uh, win Canton for the third time. Yeah, good ground, flat tracks. The horse really comes alive. So yeah, no surprise to see him get the job done there. Of course, his life was made easier by Goshen coming out uh, as on the count of the ground being too quick. All of the gin joints, yeah, was a loser. However, was a uh, you could say you know one for your your eye catching notebook. Uh, I mean, we talked about the revival of Colin Tizard. Uh, this horse had the first time linkers jumped. I think he went off about. He was 20s into round eight. Uh, he touched favourite in running, came into the home straight, absolutely tanking, made an error at the first in the home straight and then weakened. Uh, noticeable how he went left-handed at every obstacle. So I've got him in the notebook. Um, give him a, when the, when the winter grounds around, just don't worry about him. Very much in mind of a, a left-handed handicap in the spring. Uh, I, I think there's definitely a, there's definitely mileage in there because he's shaped with a lot of old zest for 90% of that race. So, yeah, that was that. Um, on to this weekend. Uh, unsurprisingly, Joe, I'm sticking with Cheltenham. Now, Bundoran on Friday is a, is a really interesting one here. Uh, there's every possibility a horse at the age of 10 has just gone and the fires don't burn. However, it's had a wind operation uh, since last scene. And if you take the, the disappointing run at Cheltenham when last scene from Bundoran, the horse has a terrific record in his track. I think form figures are 2-2, two, 1-2-3, two, two, including we're bolting up in this race by eight legs three years ago, has come plummeted down the weights, has rated 160 only 18 months ago, down to 140, which is only, as I said, two pound higher than when winning uh, winning this contest three years ago, was beating a neck in the grand annual here off eight pound higher mark. He, he's well treated in old form. He's had the wind up, ground's fine. He could be gone at the game, but though I don't mind taking a chance at 16 to one. Uh, if you see what I'm saying, uh, you're getting a decent price to find out about a horse who has some scintillating course on. Yeah, so Bundoran on Friday, I'm hoping to go well in that handicap chase. Uh, where else are we going? Yeah, we've got um, Sporting John, interesting one on the Saturday uh, in the, the three mile handicap hurdle there. Right? This is a horse who fluked the City Isles chase, it has to be said. I think me and Stephen talked about this at the time. Um, mm. uh, Shamblu fell in a hole, his legs went like jelly on heavy ground. Uh, Hitman fell, Dane the 
company was brought down. I mean, yeah, it was bumper carts and uh, he was hitting everything at the back over fences under Dickie Johnson and kind of just stayed on when everything else stopped. Uh, he's not a natural jumper. We saw that uh, in the festival novices chase at the festival. He jumps like a snooker table. Um, he's back over hurdles. He's had a wind operation. He's totally unexposed. He looked really exciting. Let's not forget, I mean, he was sent off, what, 7-2 to two to beat Envoy Allen in the Ballymore only the season before last. Uh, he was unbeaten going into that. He's clearly not been the most straightforward, but he's not a jumper. He's in a handicap hurdle off 1-4-6. Uh, he definitely one of those, uh, again, uh, with a lot of those kind of connections, uh, the, the market late doors would probably be a good guy. But I'm going to roll the dice because if he's right, um, yeah, and the wind ops worked and he's on song here. This is, put it this way, on paper at least anyway, this is the easiest assignment he's running perhaps for about two years. So I'm going to take the chance of sporting John there. And you also like the look of Oscar Elite as well, Ed, and also, of course, Tritonic, which we touched on earlier in the show. Just talk us through Oscar Elite. Why do you fancy yeah, him? Yeah, we... Yeah, absolutely. Oscar Lee. Well, I just think um, Kim Bailey's horse is going to run. Does he know? I'm not totally convinced by his jumping and he's got to give weight to Oscar Lee. For my my friends of Team Tizard, who are back mm-hmm. firing all cylinders, they really are banging in winners right mm-hmm. left and centre. Uh, this horse had some very good hurdle form. He's runner up in the Albert Park. Let's not forget, they ran a storm or eight tree when third in the grey one there behind a hoist senior brave man's game. That looks pretty smart form. And like I said, he's going to be getting weight from Kim Bailey's horse here, who's um, got double double penalised for two wins at Chelton, funny enough, and I just thought could be the, the one to, to be on there. And yeah, Tritonic we've touched upon. Uh, it's now or never for that horse, but I just think good ground and a 20-runner 20 20 runner race uh, will suit him a lot better than some of these uh, three-runner races he's been in. Well, some great value picks there from Ed and, of course, Stephen as well. Thanks a lot, guys, for your preview this week and also your tips course if you are going to be placing a bet on these selections we do as always ask you gamble responsibly but that wraps it up for this week's edition of jump to it of course check out irishracing.com for more news views and plenty of top advice but for now that wraps it up and thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you again next week